Hello, it's Joey. On October 21st, we had the pleasure of having a webinar and virtual tasting with the head winemaker of Bonterra, Jeff Sahaki. It was awesome, man. Um, he talked about his wines, not only his wines, but also the process of making organic wine overall. Everybody learned a lot. It was really cool. So here it is, in case you missed it or if you want to watch it again, if you were there. Uh, before we do that, I want to thank Adam from Horizon, Signature and Horizon, and uh, just everybody else that made this happen. It was a good time, and here it is. Enjoy. Awesome. Well, I'll give some people a little time to, to join in here. Uh, I do want to introduce our, our folks from out in the West Coast. We, we have a honored guest in, in Jeff Sahaki, our, our winemaker for Bonterra, head winemaker. Um, I've known Jeff for as long as I've been with the company. Great guy, and, and I think he's going to walk you through the wines in, in good fashion. We also have Taylor and Gabby. Gabby from our hospitality team and Taylor from our marketing team. And then of course we have Adam calling in from, from the Cape. He's, he's local. I'm not too far from everybody. I'm, I'm over in Stonington, Connecticut. Um, so in a, in a special thanks to, to the team at Luke's. I know we have uh, a few people, possibly uh, Todd Paveo and, and a few other people on the call. So. Um, thanks to everybody. Thanks for your support. And uh, we will get underway. And I, I hope you enjoy the wines. And please feel free to ask some questions uh, as we move along. Excellent. Right. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Taylor Johnson. Um, as Steve mentioned, I am part of the brand team and so fortunate to get to work so closely with Jeff. Um, so our, our hope over the next, call it 35, 45 minutes, give or take, is to give you a little additional insight about Bonterra, what it means to farm organically, and of course, spend some time enjoying the beautiful wines that, uh, that you have in front of you. Um, so we'll, we will start off with a little bit of history. So I do want to make sure that um, you've got something in your glass. The first wine that we will be enjoying is Bonterra Sauvignon Blanc. So I encourage you to go ahead, crack open the bottle, pour yourself a glass, start to familiarize. It's a really tough job to do research, but start to familiarize yourself with a glass of wine and, uh, and, and we'll definitely spend some time talking, talking about this beautiful wine. Um, but firstly, just wanted to talk a little bit about history since uh, this is kind of the, the fun new way in which we are connecting with folks all around the, uh, the US. We're doing these virtual seminars. We wish that we, we could be entertaining you all at, uh, at Bonterra. This is the, the sort of hallmark barn that you see on your screen here, the iconic Bonterra barn. This is where um, truly things all began for Bonterra and Mendocino County. So the barn that you see here is featured on our McNabb Ranch, which was the first vineyard that um, we started farming organically. And Jeff, I think, um, you know, there's always a, a, an interesting story and in history to how we got these beginnings. And I think it's, um, of course, important to share with those on the line with us today. So Jeff, do you mind talking a little bit about the inspiration of organic farming? Sure. Thanks, Taylor. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll talk about how the genesis of how Bonterra came about. Hey, and welcome, everybody. Welcome to our virtual tasting. Um, this is, like Taylor said, this is kind of the new way we're doing things, and it seems to be working out, and we're reaching out to a lot of people across the country, and, and the fun part is getting wine in front of people, and we can talk about the wines, and you guys can ask questions. So, make, you know, if you have some questions formulating as we're talking, just... I think there's a chat feature we can we can uh, refer to, and you can yes, type I think them in the there. Q and A feature. We'll be monitoring the Q and A. Yeah. I'll keep checking it to see as uh, as you have questions. Don't hesitate to enter them in. Cool. Yeah. So I'll start about you know the genesis of, of Bonterra, how it started, and and really goes back to the Fetzer family because the Bonterra was part of the you know Fetzer family of wines, and to the Fetzer, um, you know the the label Fetzer back in the day was they're really was really important to them was food and wine pairing. And um, they really thought the connection was, you know, very important. And one of the ways they wanted to enforce, you know, kind of re reinforce that was they had a nice big five acre garden that was all certified organically grown uh, fruits and vegetables. And this was back in about over 30 years ago. This was in the uh, late eighties. 
And, you know, we're kind of, we're blessed with a super intense foodie movement right now. There's great food all over the country. There's incredible produce, farmer's markets. Back in the 80s, it was kind of a little, you know, it wasn't as, as big a thing. And, you know, I had, you had your, you know, some of your chefs and celebrity chefs and cookbook chefs. But, um, but the, the Fetzer family really wanted to showcase the connection between food and wine. So when you're eating your dinner, you're pairing it with a, a fine wine. And this garden really took off and attracted a lot of the top chefs of the time. Uh, you're talking uh, Emeril and Julia Childs that were out at the, at the winery, at the demonstration kitchen cooking for, for folks and pulling all this great produce out of the, you know, uh, this five acre certified organic garden. And um, one of the gardeners there, his name is Michael Maltos. He was um, gardener of the year in the 80s, uh, gardening, organic gardening magazine. Um, and he was, you know, really intense uh, guy and really intent on, on organic practices, uh, creating these fruits and vegetables. I mean, he would like, you know, you know, 50 different types of tomatoes and, you know, dozens of apple trees of different varieties. So it was really just eye-opening. I mean, back 30 plus years ago, you go to the grocery store and you may find, you know, cherry tomatoes, beefsteak tomatoes and that and Romas maybe. And that was it. You didn't see the heirlooms we have today. We're, you know, we're really fortunate living in good times with good food. Um, so we are bringing all this great produce out of this garden and the, our gardener really approached our vineyard operations and said, hey, we could see the success we're having here why don't we apply some of these organic practices in our own vineyards? And it really hadn't been done yet. And uh, farmers, you know, and grape growers are generally a conservative type, don't like a lot of change. And this was a major change. And this is something they would they'd pretty much react and saying, yeah, you could do it, you know, fruits and vegetables, but we're talking, you know, you know, farming at scale to make enough grapes for a winery is a different, different animal. But he was very persistent. And he really, you know, he said, you know, I look at the health of these, these fruits and vegetables and the apple trees, and, you know, there's, at the time, it was really a new concept. Uh, this was over 30 years ago. And, but it was persistent. And sure enough, we started converting some of our vineyards from uh, conventional farm uh, to organic farming. And uh, there's a lot of trial and error. And it wasn't easy because it's not something that was even taught in the universities at the time. There's really, there's no books on how to do it. A lot of trial and error, like I said. But we saw seeing some great results. And the vines seemed healthier, the, the fruit, you know, we, we thought the fruit was uh, more expressive. And so it was something that really we thought, okay, this is interesting. We may be too far ahead of the curve here. No one's really doing it, but we should pursue it. And from that point back over 30 years ago, uh, we started converting all our acreage. And to this day, we have over a thousand acres. We farm a certified organic and certified biodynamic as well. Some, And it's uh, been part of our legacy, part of our heritage. And we've really, uh, put Bonterra on the map as a pioneer in this world of making great wines from organic grapes. Yeah, I think to your point, Jeff, I mean, it's so incredibly exciting that we've been doing this for over 30 years before it was really a thing. It's it's truly a part of, you know, our our DNA, our our, um, our soul of the brand, just this the stewardship of, stewardship of the land, that focus commitment that we have with the environment, I think, um, you know, it, it, it sort of helps to enjoy these beautiful wines. And of course it helps that Jeff, you, you do such a stellar job in uh, <laughs> such fantastic wines. So you talked a little bit about certification. Mm -hmm. um, do you mind kind of elaborating on, you know, the key differences of sure. being organically versus conventionally yeah. and, what it takes to maintain that certification. Sure, yeah, it's, so at its root, when you're farming organically, what you're doing is you're not using any synthetics in the farming process. That's at the, at the root, that's the basis of it. Um, so you're not using any synthetic fertilizers, synthetic pesticides, or synthetic herbicides. Um, so you're, you're, you're not using these synthetics, but you know, the challenge is what, how do you replace them? And what, what do you do in lieu of them? And that's where the last, some of the trial and error comes in. Um, but, you know, there's workarounds and that's those over the last 30 years as we've, you know, determined how to approach it. Um, and, you know, early on, there was not a national organic program. Uh, in the 90s, there became one. It's part of the USDA. So it's a federal program that certifies that all organic farming or, or production is done a certain way and it's certified and audited every year. Um, if you look at our bottles of wine you may have in front of you, you'll see a little uh, certification uh, mark on there. It's from CCOF, which is California Certified Organic Farmers. And they basically, their job is to ensure that we are following the national organic program called the NOP. 
and we do a very thorough audit every year um, where they come out and an auditor comes out and visits the, the vineyards as you see on this, the slide here and then into the winery because both our vineyards are certified organic and the winery is also certified organic so we were, we're, we're certifying the farming process and the production process so it's a two-step certification and like i said it's yearly renewal yearly audits it's thorough too it's not no fly-by-night hippie thing it's a it's a they go into our i mean honestly they, it takes a full day or actually now it takes two days one for vineyards and the one for the winery and we'll go into the warehouse and we'll grab a bottle of wine from a case and a pallet of wine and they'll say okay now jeff trace this back all the way everything that happened to this wine every addition every blending every um every process all the way back to certified organic way tags from the vineyard. So, I mean, every step of the way is scrutinized um, to ensure that you're getting a product that is, you know, uh, you know, certified organic. So it's, it's a thorough process and it's meaningful. And I, it's, you know, one of the sure ways that you can um, know that you're getting a product that is, is what it claims it to be. And, and there's a lot of, you know, claims out there these days, but I think, looking for that certified organic label is really important. And that's why we've, we've been doing it for so many years. It's, 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 a, um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it guarantees you're getting the product that you expect to be getting from an organic. Yes, agreed. It, that, that third party credential I think is, is so important. And hopefully, you know, for all of you at, at home as you're enjoying these wines, you, know, you, you have that confidence that um, these wines certainly deliver, of course, best of the best quality, but also knowing that um, we're doing good by the organic farming practices that we employ within the vineyards. So it's, uh, it's incredibly exciting. So I know Jeff, we are in October prime time in terms of harvest. Yes, uh, we are. Kind of sharing, you're still smiling, which is great. <laughs> well, <laughs> I just I had a couple of sips of wine, so I feel pretty good. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> Do you do you mind sharing uh, an update with everyone sure. sort of where we are in, in terms of bringing fruit in and how much longer we have on the horizon? Yeah, so it's like it's mid-October and we've been in harvest mode for almost two months now. I mean, it, honestly, it starts late August, all of September. Um, and, and, you know, it starts and, and it, it, it progresses. I mean, early on, you have some of the white varieties coming in early, the South Blanc, um, and they move into Pinot Noir. And then some Chardonnay comes in, a big slug of Chardonnay comes in. And some of the lighter body reds, like the Zinfandels, and then to Merlots. And I mean, and right now we're we're kind of kind of see the finish line a week or two away. Where right now it's the the bigger, bolder reds are coming in now. So Petit Syrah, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, right now is coming in, and it's um, so it's you know we're mid stride right now. The winery is really full. There's a lot of tanks full of red fermenting grapes right now. At this point, all our Chardonnay is barreled down and fermenting in barrels. Sau Blanc is nearly done and nearly fermented dry. We'll actually, we'll be get, get blending the Sau Blanc in a couple of weeks here and getting that ready for a release early in the next year. So that's one of the first ones we release. Um, so yeah, it, it's very, it's, you know, each harvest is different. Uh, we had a nice, very, uh, it was warm harvest, uh, dry conditions. Um, I mean, and you can see in this, the, the the slide here, you can see the brown hill, you see the green vineyards in the foreground, our garden, our barn, but the brown hills in the background indicates the, the weather we have here. I mean, California for the last five months, it really hasn't rained. And that's the, that's the beauty of growing grapes in California. There's no threat of uh, pressure from mold, mildews or rot because of, you know, I think our grapes are just little balls of sugar, basically. They're 25% sugar sitting out there. And then you start, in, if you introduce uh, moisture or rain into the, the equation, uh, rot will ensue. That's why it's tough to grow grapes in other places. They'll grow, but it's tough to get the quality that we'd like to see from, you know, and if you're up in here in Mendocino County, we have really ideal conditions. We have hot days, we have, you know, 95 degree, degree days, uh, no rain for months on end, but we have the ocean right there and the ocean's Honestly, the ocean's about 55 degrees year round. It's chilly. It's not, it's not that Southern California, um, uh, sandy volleyball type of beaches. It's rugged, cold coastline up here. Uh, not so great for uh, surfing or volleyball, but it's great for growing grapes because it's, it's a, mod, a temperature moderator. So even though it's maybe 95, 100 degrees during the day here up in Mendocino County, we, we're guaranteed it's going to cool down to 55, 60 every night because of that ocean influence. So that's what makes it so important. Uh, but you know, it's um, it, it's it's a it's a ideal spot, and we're really fortunate to to have our our harvest here um, go so well this year. 
um, it's uh, the quality is great. We're really, we're really thrilled with what we're seeing in the tanks right now. Thanks, Jeff. There was a question that came in about sourcing. So I know sure. on the slides you're seeing beautiful views of our home ranch, McNabb Ranch. There was a question about um, why our wines are, are appellated as California versus single vineyard or sure. uh, appellated Mendocino County. Um, so, you know, I think, Jeff, I'm sure you have yeah. thoughts on this too. I think it's very exciting that consumers are embracing our wine so much so that we couldn't supply enough from our internal vineyards. And mm. that has afforded us the ability to do is partner with farmers throughout the state of California. And we've partnered with many of them to convert from conventional farming to organic. Um, so yes, you do see a California appellation on our labels, um, but that has afforded, I think, a, a bigger conversation, a bigger discussion of grape growers understanding the importance of organic farming. So it's enabled us to, uh, to help move the needle in terms of broader mindset with organic farming. Yeah, although we farm a thousand acres ourselves, we do still require more than what we farm. So we moved to, we, we, we go to outside areas. Um, so we, yeah, we get grapes from the uh, central coast of California as well, from like the Paso Robles area. Um, we do, we generally focus on things that are very coastal influenced, like we have here in Mendocino County. And, um, you know, it, it also kind of allows us to diversify some of our flavor profiles too, which is really nice too. And honestly too, diversify risk too, because we are at risk up here in the North Coast of California. We, the, you know, the first of the winter storms could start coming through any time now and could challenge our harvest here. So if we diversify our vineyard holdings and where we have sourced from, we, you know, the central coast of California is a little less threatened by it. So we actually diversify our risk a little bit, make sure we get consistent quality year to year to year um, by having vineyards throughout the state of California. So um, we do, yeah, we do, it, all, it, it enables me to travel to and see the state and look at the vineyards throughout the, from all the way down to Santa Barbara, really from just north of uh, Southern California, all the way to north of uh, us here in Mendocino County too. So I think that diversity really helps too in the wines too. And we do make some single vineyards to the, your, someone's point on the question. We have a couple of wines that we think the quality is so good from specific spots like our McNabb home ranch on the slide here or our Butler ranch um, that they deserve a, a, a special wine that made from a single vineyard. So um, that's not possible to do that at scale, you know, when you want to supply the entire country with wine, but for some special one-offs, you can really do that. Um, and certain, certain wines still hold a Mendocino County appellation too. I think Zinfandel does for now, does it as well. And then our Pinot Noir program uh, is, is a Mendocino County appellated as well. So we have a quite a, a broad range, but generally the larger production wines that have such demand, we really need to go outside Mendocino a little bit. And one of the limiting, limiting factors is um, because of the rules for the TTB, those the government agency that runs um, alcohol uh, compliance, for the federal government, um, we for a while we would have like three counties on there. We'd have Mendocino Lake and Sonoma, or something to that effect. But once you put a fourth county on there, it's not possible. You have to go to the state of California, which is a large. Uh, of course, it's a large state, but that's just illegal. Uh, you know what's required for on un labeling. So um, that's why you see many of these uh, vintages or the appellations with California on the label. That's a good question. Yeah, and, and one more question before, we, there's a couple questions in the queue, but I know we want to start focusing on the wines too. Sure. Jeff, this one I felt would be near and dear to your heart. Someone asked, um, why is your Merlot so fantastic? Uh, <laughs> it's one of your faves. Yeah, it's uh, a Merlot. You know, we take it seriously. I think that's why we, we like Merlot. We've always been a proponent of Merlot. Um, you know, it's, we thought it's, it's a variety that does really well here in our ranch. You know, this, this actually this view of McNabb, a lot of that acreage you're looking at is Merlot right there. Great ground. Uh, we take it seriously. It's, it's uh, and we like ripe Merlot too. It, you know, when people describe what Merlot should taste like, to me, it should be, taste like ripe plums. And that's, the, we're going for every year. And I think as we, as long as we get close to that ideal, the, the wines should turn out nice. Beautiful. Well, let's let's get into the wines. That's sure. I think and I'm, I'm sure everyone loves hearing about the history. They can appreciate the wines that much more. But they're excited to dig in and learn about uh, the three things that we have for them today. Sure. So the first wine on our flight today is our South Long. This is 2019 vintage. Um, and you know this 
wine's been around since around 2007 when we started with some of our, uh, some of our new vineyards came online and it's grown ever since it's very it's, it's on a very rapid pace of expansion right now and i think it's because the style is really a, people like it a lot it's very approachable it's very kind of a new world style i think similar you might find from new zealand with a lot of grassiness and and grapefruit is what really drives this wine though so that that bright citrus and vibrant grapefruit is really what you know you come to expect when you taste the bonter uh, uh sauvignon blanc it's all stainless steel fermented to, to maintain all that nice crisp acidity no oak at all in this process of producing this wine um, and our sourcing, we look for vineyards that um, give us the flavor profiles we like. You know, some vineyards tend to be more citrus based than grapefruit, and some tend to be more tropical. Um, a lot of it has to do with how you know, we farm and how we ask our farming partners to farm. Um, one of the things that really benefits a good Sap Blanc vineyard is uh, having the fruit grown in the shade or the shade of the canopy of the vine. So we don't like a lot of sun exposure on the fruit. When you see a lot of sun on the, directly hitting the berries, you know, in the heat of the day, or even, uh, um, you tend to get more tropical flavors, more, you know, uh, those kind of, uh, uh, you know, even like pineapple and guava and those aromas. We like leaning more towards the citrus and this, this, this nice grapefruit. And so we get that by, you know, pruning and allowing some leaves to, pr to, to shade the fruit a little bit. And, and some 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 blending from different counties. A lot of this fruit comes. We the grapes we get from for this wine comes from Lake County, which is the county just to the um, east of Mendocino, uh, in a little area, Kelseyville. Uh, great, nice, deep, rich soils, which allow for this nice big canopy to form and allow the grapes to ripen in the way we want. Fun wine. Um, just the, the I think it's a you know just we meet this great balance of you know crispness and good acidity but still juicy and really quaffable. It's just a wine that has a, finds a really like a thirst quenching balance. Um, and you rest assured the style of this wine won't change because it's my wife's favorite wine. And if I ever change it, I'm totally in the doghouse. So not gonna change. Yeah, so look for consistency in this one for sure. It's certainly one of our, our favorites. This is um, this, you know, this was having a moment in, in spring. We thought it was having a moment in summer and it just continues on as we, as we move into fall. This wine is just uh, an easy drink and one of our favorites for sure. And in a couple different formats too. You'll find it in the, you know, across obviously 750 bottle here. We do have it in cans. We do have it in um, a bag and box in some markets too. So you get a 1.5 liter bag of box, which is pretty cool. And then, um, one of my favorites is that we can get it kegs too for restaurants and on premise. So you can find it on draft in certain markets too, which is really kind of fun. Uh, I actually, I actually took the beer out of my kegerator one year and put a keg of Sav Blanc in there. And uh, my wife thought that was the best thing in the world. So until our family came over and drank it all, I have to be able to, but anyway, that you run that risk. So, you know, you have, if you have a five gallons yes. of wine, <laughs> yeah, I learned the lesson though. When you have a bottle of wine at a party, people generally take a, like a, you know, a nice amount. They, they're not, they like to share, right? They want to take the last. When you have a keg of wine, people just like hit that tap handle so hard. And I saw like stem breaking amounts of wine coming through our house that, that was at the party we're having. So careful with kegs. No, careful. Well, I think we all want an invite to the next Say Hi. I know, that's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we love that. Um, okay, Jeff, just a couple more questions before we, before we move on to the next one. Sure. Um, one of which is I know, you know, certainly kind of a, a hot topic as of today is, you know, more and more folks are inquiring about vegan and vegan friendly wines. Mm -hmm. um, so can you talk about this wine? Sure. Does that apply? So um, a lot of our wines are, are vegan friendly. Um, the, you know, you, we wonder what, what would ever be in wine that would not be vegan. And, and there are some couple things in the process that aren't. Um, so as a rule, our white wines are vegan. Um, the Sa Blanc, the Chardonnay, the Rosé. Um, where wines become may not be vegan um, are in the red wine world, where we use egg whites for fining. It's a very traditional way of pulling out phenolics or drying flavors or textures in the wine. Um, and we use we have to use certified organic egg whites because we're an organic product. But um, so egg whites are put in the wine, they attract, the proteins in the egg whites attract these phenolics and they fall out. And we take the clear to the bottom of the cask or barrel or tank. And then we take the, the wine off the top of that, leave the egg whites behind. So from, a, from the standpoint of like an allergen, there is no egg whites in the wine. It's all racked and filtered out. But the fact that 
egg whites were used in the process, we, we say that's not vegan friendly because they're egg whites used um, from, a, from an allergen standpoint, there are no egg whites in there really per se, but some were used in the process. Um, there are a few products like that are they're used in the wine industry. This is a very traditional one. It's used in France for thousands of years making wine. Um, it's a very gentle way to, to find your wine and it's very effective. So we do use that. You know, we, we're looking at other methods. There's other methods like pea protein and potato protein and some other things. But as we experimented with those things, they do kind of leave some, some uh, aromatics like green peas, which is maybe you don't want to find in your wine. I don't know. But uh, we're experimenting because we're looking, you know, we're trying to have a, a really broad appeal to people who uh, uh, are looking for vegan products. Thank you, Jeff. Sure. And, and then one uh, question before we move on to the reds. I think Adam called it. Uh, there's a lot of love in the air for uh, for Viognier. I think it's bittersweet. Oh yeah. Wine is, is no longer. So there's a question about you know how come it's no longer a part of the ongoing offerings. No, it's it's it has to do with uh, farming Viognier and specifically the vineyard that was sourcing that Viognier. Um, one of our internal vineyards, uh, Valley Oaks Vineyard, um, is really production is way down almost to, you know, give, give you an idea, an acre of grapes can produce up to about, in a nice big, you know, vigorous Chardonnay vineyard, eight tons per acre. So it's quite a bit. So that's 16,000 pounds of grapes per acre. So a lot. Um, our VNA, our poor VNA vineyard, which was around for a long time, was to the point where it was producing like less than two tons, maybe one and a half tons per acre. So we just couldn't, it, it was not, um, producing enough to, 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 to viably continue the program. It was small to begin with and it kept on getting smaller each year. Um, and, uh, and I, you know, along with the, the folks who asked the question, I, I missed the program as well. v &A was a real fun one for me as well. I thought it was a really unique flavor profile with all the great peaches and apricots in there. Um, you know, but maybe as we redevelop our vineyards, we may, you know, hope to see something come back or maybe a, maybe a small direct consumer. So keep an eye on, on you know, at Bonterra, and we may have some offerings in the future. Um, may not be something we can offer nationwide, but it's, uh, if it's something you're looking for, keep keep a lookout. You know, we try to do one-offs for people in our wine club and stuff like that. So keep posted on that one. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, we're going to shift gears from a palette perspective and move into our Equinox Red, one of our um, red blends. So, Jeff, do you mind? Talking about this wine? Sure, sure. Um, so red blends have been pretty popular the last you know, 10 years now, actually. And it really, there was a peak for a while. Um, that uh, it got people into, you know, in the idea of red blends. And it, it allows me to, as a winemaker, to get really creative with uh, a blending. Because that's one of the more fun aspects of making wine is creating you know, different mixtures and different blends. Um, we kind of held back to see what the category was doing. And then after we looked at it for a while, we thought, well, what would be a very Bonterra way to approach red blends? And, you know, so we thought, you know, we want something that's, you know, more of a serious wine, um, something that's not a throwaway kind of sweet and oaky. We want something that was, you know, had some great structure and um, achieve it in a way that's, that was very kind of through blending. And, and one of the ways we did that, if you can see on the slide here, um, the leading varietal there is Petite Syrah. So that's how you get that great color in the glass here. So, you know, Petite Syrah, and then to complement Petite Syrah, which has great structure and, and big tannins, we want something soft and rich. So we work with some Merlot in there as well too. So that combination of Petite Syrah and Merlot is really the basis of this Equinox Red. Um, so yeah, it was a, a, a wine we felt was lacking in our portfolio. So we thought, it would, let's get together, put this wine together and it's been a great success. I love the wine, I drink it all the time. Uh, Cause it's super, it's big, it's bold, it's got great color, nice ripe flavors in it. Um, and it, it's super versatile when it comes to the you know, spiciness and food pairing, you know, anything you could possibly grill works with this for sure. You know, whether it's, you know, you know gr nice huge cuts of meat or just easy burgers, you know, it's, you don't have to really think about it. You can just really enjoy whatever you like to grill, um, works great. And as a, and the, you know, it's not really cooling off here. It doesn't feel like fall yet, but as our fall cooking dishes get more hearty and more savory, this is the type of wine that you really want to grab to as you're doing those long, slow cook type of meals that you really, um, you, you develop, when you develop a lot of flavor and a slow, low cooking process, you know, you can really find a wine that will complement it. This would sure, sure be it for sure. Jeff, that's a good point. We didn't uh, we didn't get your go-to easy pairing for Sauvignon Blanc. Do you oh, have? Oh yeah. You know, uh, 
it's, it's pretty sub long. We missed that one, but it's pretty versatile too. I mean, recently I had one, uh, I was making some fish tacos and I didn't, it was nice crispy fish tacos with a nice, uh, some little cabbage slaw and some good spice to it. It worked really well. Um, that was a fun one. But you know, one of my favorite ones for just snacking is just a great, a good goat cheese and, and sub long really is a, was a great pairing. So you can, um, and I'm all, I'm super open to pairings, you know, whatever works, you know, it's, and get creative too. I always encourage people don't, there's just, first of all, it has to be something you like, you know, don't, don't pretend to like something just because wine might pair well with it. Start with something you like for sure first and then move on to the wines. But uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, and that's, you know, and it harkens way back to the early days that we were talking about Fetzer family and food and wine pairing. It's, 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 it's all about having fun and enjoying the, 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 thing, the food you like with the, the wines you like as well. Well, we got a great, uh, a great recommendation as well that came in through the, uh, the Q&A feature about specifically for Equinox, thinking about a nice veggie pizza with sort of mushrooms. Oh, yeah. Herbs, to kind of hit some of that earthy, savory component, which yeah. sounds delicious. That sounds great. And, and, and yeah, especially when you have something that's like mushrooms have that great earthy component to it. And that, I think it works really well. It's a big, bold red, red wine like that has a lot of spice to it. Yeah, that sounds great. It's, okay. it's Wednesday, right? That's usually a pizza night. So I'm like, I'm like take someone up on that one. <laughs> there you go. Or There's order so something to pick up on the way home. <laughs> it's perfect. It's perfect. Well, let's, uh, let's move to the final wine, which is our Cabernet Sauvignon. Sure. So this is a, you know, another one of our classic you know, core wines we make up on Terra. Um, it's the, you know, obviously the largest product we make from the red wines. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the keys for getting Cab Cabernet correct for me is picking correctly, picking ripe. And because Cabernet, amongst other grapes, similar like to Merlot sometimes as well, can get kind of green if it's underripe. So it's, the key is really knowing your vineyards, picking correctly, and getting this, this avoiding any green components. And when I talk about green components in Cabernet, it could be bell pepper or kind of green bean aromas. And we really don't like those in the, in the glass. So we're picking specifically for nice ripe aromas and flavors. When you pick that way too, you also tend to have more resolved tannins, softer tannins, less of that drying effect that you get from the phenolics of the wine. Um, there's some blending that goes on here too. And you can see Petit Syrah is the number two of the, in, the, in the slide here. And Petit Syrah adds a great uh, texture and color to the wine. Uh, and it really brings out some depth too. So. And this is, uh, this is one we, we do source throughout the state of California, as someone brought up earlier about the Appalachian. But this, you know, I think this one really benefits from that Appalachian being so big um, because a lot of our sourcing is from the Paso Robles area, which is great, great sourcing for red wines. I mean, our home is up in Mendocino, but I have respect for every, any region that does, does a good job growing grapes. So you have to just, um, just be aware and, and celebrate what each region does really well. And big, bold red wine, grapes do a really good job in the Paso Robles area in central California. It's about I mean, 250 miles south of here. So it's a distance, but we're able to you know, manage it and make sure we make all the right picking decisions and get the uh, fruit right where we want it. So this does see a little bit of, um, along with Equinox Red, there's some, you might pick up some oak as you're tasting this as well. Um, so it does see a little bit of French and American oak. Um, and that's just gives some more spice and some more character. Um, and a little bit of, uh, sometimes even a little vanilla, and, uh, uh, aromatics and, and flavors as well. Yeah, beautiful wine. So appreciative to be able to go through each wine, understand the, the history, the thinking, and what you're striving for stylistically. Um, so I'd love to just maybe take another moment or two if there's any final questions that, uh, that any of you are curious to know um let's see there's one question that just came in about which i think is a really great great question um is consumers often asking about you know are these wines sulfite free oh yeah that's a good question and um, so, and, and yeah yeah perfect. so let me, i'll touch on that so the category we're in is you see in the front label there on the slide it says made with organically grown grapes um so these our wines are not sulfite free they uh, there is a category of or called organic wine, which is sulfite free. Um, we use a reduced amount of sulfites. We, can, we cannot have more than the 100 parts per million total sulfites in our wine. 
uh, otherwise it wouldn't be considered made with organic category. We choose this category to be in rather than the sulfite free category because um, we do think sulfites uh, protect the wine and allow the wines to age properly. And when we ship our wine throughout the country, throughout the world, we're in over a hundred countries throughout the world we ship, we want the wines to arrive the way we intend them for the consumers to enjoy them. Um, and one, one way of doing that, doing that is using a, a, a small amount of sulfites in, in the winemaking process. Because um, sulfites do three important things. They're antimicrobial, antibacterial, and they're oxygen scavenger too. So they really protect the wine and allow it to age slowly and properly. Um, but you will you know, know that we do use a, a less the sulfites than in conventional winemaking. And um, it's very strict too. It's one of the, you know, when I mentioned that audit earlier, our records are, are scrutinized to make sure that we do not ever go above 100 parts per million too. So conventional wines can have uh, several hundred parts per million just as a kind of a, an idea of what is out there. We just think it's very important. And, and, and sulfites do get a bad rap too, I think. There are some people who are certainly affected by sulfites and they, did, they get blamed for a lot of things, you know, terrible hangovers and headaches and whatever. But really there's a small part of the population that when they're, from my research, it's more of an asthmatic, it's a respiratory issue uh, that's, that they get from, salt in, you know, from consuming products with sulfites in it. And uh, so that is a culprit for some people, uh, but we think that a small light use of sulfites is important for white quality. So that's where we choose to be um, in, in this made with category. So when you see that label, that you know there are some sulfites in there and it does still say that, you know, the back label does say it contains sulfites as any wine that does contain sulfites. Um, um, we'll, we'll have that printed on there. The funny thing is the act of fermentation, making the wine creates sulfites sometimes too, fermentation. So it's really tough to make a wine that's sulfite free. You know, it's very, you have to be, even, even on the scale to be called sulfite free wine, it's less than 10 parts per million um, is what the acceptable level to be sulfite free is. Um, and we just don't think that protects the wine enough for shipping it all over and allowed to age properly. Yeah, it's a, it's a good point, Jeff, where you work so hard on these wines and Joseph on the vineyard side, farming, yeah. you know, and as you mentioned, we, sh we ship these wines all around the world. So being able to deliver that high quality experience is, is really important to us. So we know that can be a hot topic of, mm -hmm. of discussion. Um, but again, that, that quality and, and making sure that consistent experience is, is really paramount to us. So, well, I don't believe I see any additional questions in the chat feature. We are so grateful for all of you taking the time to connect with us virtually. Again, we hope that at some point we can welcome you to, to our vineyards and, and be able to, uh, to, to toast with you in person, but instead virtually will work. We're so grateful for the time. Jeff, any, uh, any final parting words? Just say thanks for participating in our tasting here. I hope you got some uh, interesting facts and about the wines and I hope we answered some of your questions. And you know, I, it's, it's fun to get out and talk to people. We haven't done it in person lately, but it, this is a great way to reach out and uh, share our wines with folks from all over the country. So cheers and thank you for uh, spending some time with us and enjoy the rest of the wine. You got it. And there's one last question. Rose oh, there is. Oh, cool. Rosé, you're round. Rosé, you're round. All year round. So it is available <laughs> all year round for you. That was the final final question. And then a nice thank you. We, Luke's, Luke's, Luke's loves your wine and, and we appreciate all that you do. So <laughs> thanks. Thanks so much, everyone. We've got Rosé, your wine and a, a bounty of, uh, of more wines for you to enjoy. All right, you guys take care. Have a lovely evening. Cheers. Cheers, everyone. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.